Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Stephanie Cristello. I'm the Director of Programming for Expo Chicago and the Editor-in-Chief of The Seed, Chicago's International Journal of Contemporary and Modern Art. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to Dialogues, presented in partnership with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Dialogues is a year-round series of panels, symposia, and provocative artistic discourse featuring leading artists, curators, and arts professionals on the current issues that engage them. Today, we are thrilled to be presenting a keynote with Sheikh Ahur al Qasemi, the president and director of the Sharjah Art Foundation, as part of Global Art Geographies on the Dialogue stage. I wanted to briefly introduce Hur before giving her the stage to continue her presentation. Hur al Qasemi is the president and director of the Sharjah Art Foundation and also a practicing artist who studied at the Slade School of Fine Art, Royal Academy of Arts, and the Royal College of Art in London. She was appointed the curator of the Sharjah Biennial VI in 2003, and has since been the Biennial Director. Kasemi serves on the board of directors for MoMA PS1 in New York, KW Institute for Contemporary Art in Berlin, the International Biennial Association in Guangzhou, and many, many others. Please join me in extending a very warm welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for Expo Chicago for inviting me. Sorry, it's a little bit bright, so if I squint, I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted to um, briefly introduce Sharjah to those people who don't know about Sharjah and the Art Foundation. I see a lot of familiar faces who already know, so excuse me if you've already seen these images before. So the Sharjah Art Foundation is actually in the old part of the city. It's in the oldest part of the country, I would say. It's by the port, and it's a very community. Um, our projects are very community-based because of the people around us, but we still tend to focus on international programs as well as very local community projects. So it's an interesting mix. Oops, sorry, go back a little bit. So I made a quick list of some of the programs that we do, and we, the Sharjah Art Foundation actually started as a biennial in 1993, and then the, with projects growing, I took over in 2002, and we really grew organically through working with artists. Artists wanted to do a residency, so we started a residency program. We were interested in commissioning new works, and we started co-commissioning with other institutions and partnering. So everything we tend to do is really an experimentation. So from the Sharjah Biennial, this is basically what we ended up doing at the foundation. So we have an, an, an annual meeting called the March Meeting, where institutions curators, um, artists, musicians would come from different parts of the world and meet in Sharjah. We hold a conference, but also time for roundtable discussions. And a lot of things have flourished from those meetings, not necessarily for us in Sharjah, but for different institutions to meet and get to know each other. Um, we've had like, the Sudan Film Factory meeting curators at MoMA in Sharjah and so on. And the production program actually came out of a need to do something on an off biennial year. So we would commission works for the biennial, but in the other year we started also um, an international call for artists to send their proposals and have an international jury to select a work that they, we would then produce and it could um, be premiered or um, shown at an, another event. For example, uh, in 2009, one of the works from our production program actually premiered at Documenta, two works actually premiered at Documenta. So that was great for us and for the artists, as well as the other uh, biennial, which is Documenta. Um, artists in residence is uh, obvious. The next one is an interesting one in terms of what they're talking about with this, uh, with this series of discussions. So we've been wanting to work on a curator in residence uh, program, but we're a small country. There, there are artists, but there are few who are the strongest artists, and if we invite curators to come, they most definitely choose the same artist year after year. So I tried to think about curating the region. I mean, our region is not very stable. Our region is always changing. Um, I like to define our region, I would say that, I would define our region by the people who live in the country. So I would include South Asia, I would include 
North Africa. I would include other parts of the Middle East. So it's always a complicated turn to think about who you are when you're based in that part of the world. So what I decided to do is contact a budget airline called Air Arabia who are in Sharjah. And uh, they're a budget airline because they only fly a certain amount of hours. So it's really by distance. So I thought we could really define our region through the distance that they fly. So I am defining our region through the flight map of Air Arabia, which could include Cologne, Sudan, Almaty, Nepal. And then you have an artists from the region that are exhibited, but that region is confusing to people who don't even won't understand why you have you know, a German artist alongside an artist from Nepal. And again, trying to break down the, the borders. And on the plus side, I managed to convince them to fund the whole thing. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that was a good one. Um, another project that we did was the March project. This came out of my experience as a visiting tutor at different art schools, including uh, where I studied at the Slate. And I met a lot of artists who had a lot of promise, but of course were too young to go on and have big shows. So I invited them on a type of residency called, it's almost a, um, we call it an educational residency because we train them. Uh, we give them lighting workshops. We, give them, uh, um, we uh, link them with a curator or uh, a writer or someone who could really mentor them. And in return, we, they would exhibit a work that has to be site-specific and it gets shown at a time when a lot of the art world come and visit us in Sharjah. And I was very happy that one of the um, artists who is from London, who I uh, picked out when I was uh, her tutor, is now going to be at the Liverpool Biennial next year. And uh, she got discovered through her project in Sharjah. So it's a British artist getting discovered in England, but her major project was in Sharjah. Um, the film, uh, we're also starting a, an alternative uh, film festival, to call it a film platform, because there are lots of film festivals that only focus on Hollywood and the glamorous side of film rather than the more uh, practical side um, and commissioning films because we've commissioned a lot of films uh, within the biennial so it was almost natural to get, tend to focus um, a project exact, uh, purposely for the film. So that's something that we're working on at the moment and everything else is a little bit obvious. But as I said, Charter Biennial started in 1993, and this is where it started. Sorry, this is just an image I got off Instagram. But I had to put the title in because it was Expo Sharjah. And since I'm at Expo Chicago, I thought it was fitting to, to show that. But the Biennial started there in a tent. And uh, it was really, um, it was a big deal. But when I um, got involved in 2002, I really did not want it to be associated with the trade because of you know, we're a non-profit institution, a biennial is not a fair, uh, we don't make money, um, people would be visiting a jewelry exhibition next door. It was really frustrating. So there are good memories, but at the same time, we had to move out of that, that space. Um, this is an old map of Sharjah, just to show that the area where our foundation is based mainly, uh, this is what it looked like in 1820. So it really is one of the oldest parts of the area. And you can see just some images of the area with old buildings and new buildings. Oops, it's, it's flicking pretty quickly. Anyway, um, we do a lot of site-specific projects with international artists. These are our spaces. It's an old picture because that's been completed for years. Um, but again, it's about bringing old and new together and uh, doing things site-specifically. And of course, we have a lot of international visitors, like Mama and Glenn and Klaus, visiting every year. And what's great is works that we would commission for biennials would end up in international institutions' collections. Uh, for example, Rania Stefan's film was bought, uh, was shown at MoMA for a PS1 for a whole year and, and acquired by MoMA. And other works, uh, Marwan Rashmawi acquired by Tate. And uh, one project that we wanted to do was um, Hans Ulrich's project, Do It, which is uh, um, involving artists writing instructions in a book where the public or um, other artists would uh, follow these instructions to create art. And they approached me and said, would you be interested in doing this exhibition? And I said, I'd be interested in changing it and having it as Do It in Arabic. 
and it will be a way for us to link with other Arab institutions and have a project together and a collaboration. And we asked artists uh, of Arab origin or just who lived in Arab countries to write new instructions, and we created a new book, and we called it Do It Bil Arabi, meaning Do It in Arabic. And uh, it was a great project because it really worked with, co with the community in Sharjah, in Amman, in Jordan. Uh, now it's on a townhouse Cairo. Um, it was in Ramallah, in Palestine. Uh, it's going to Marrakesh, um, so many, many other countries. And what's great is that not only does this strengthen our, um, our uh, partnerships with these institutions, but it really creates a cultural dialogue um, with other Arab countries, which is really very important for us in the region. So you can see a few images of them creating Manahatum's map. This was an, another, um, I think, fitting project when you talk about doing things outside of your country you're in or institution. So I worked a lot with a curator, Salah Hassan, who's a professor at Cornell, on many exhibitions and, and research. And I have to say I learned a lot. And, one, and when I was growing up in Sharjah, a lot of the art scene there was um, started by or uh, worked with artists and writers and poets from Sudan. But as I grew older, I felt that this connection wasn't there because the political connection wasn't there anymore. So a lot of the artists that I knew, the Sudanese artists that I knew, were all from my father's generation. So I asked Salah if he would help me do something to kind of bring back that link and uh, do something. Um, so we spoke about a conference and an exhibition. And with the uh, difficulties in doing the conference in Sudan, because we wanted to invite people from Sudan, from South Sudan, so it was really more practical to do it in Sharjah and invite people from who were living outside in the diaspora. Uh, we had uh, artists from Chicago, Amr Noor, who's here, who attended the conference and had a solo exhibition as well in Sharjah. So this was very important for us because it's not so much about working uh, globally when you're doing it outside, but also inside the country. So there's Salah. And it was a really, uh, really important conference for us. We're publishing a book. This was in April two years ago. So we're still working on the book. Uh, but it uh, involved writers, politicians, uh, artists. Um, and there are certain people who grew up outside of uh, Sudan who were hearing these people speak for the first time. So it was very important. So alongside with that, there's a huge Sudanese community in Sharjah. So we had a whole running program of like, Sudanese nights of poetry. We worked with local uh, centers, like youth centers. So again, we ended up forming a connection with the, the Sudanese population in Sharjah. So a lot comes out of a single project, which is important for us. Another project we worked on was the uh, Egyptian surrealism. Uh, which also with Salah. Uh, he was working on it with the Egyptian Ministry of Culture. And we thought it was really important, since it's an exhibition about Egyptian culture, to hold the conference in Egypt. So it's a project by us, but we're hosting, we're, we're doing it and we're being hosted by the university in Cairo because it's more important that it happens in Cairo than outside of Cairo. So some people, they understand the logic afterwards, but um, for us, it's, and also to host it, to hold the exhibition in Cairo was more important than to have it in our museum. Because really, it's the history of that country and people will travel, and it's more important for the local people in Cairo to see their own history that's been hidden in storage for many years. And um, so that was a, a really important exhibition for us. And we're also working on a book for that. So. Um, I also spoke about international curators and uh, museum directors visiting Sharjah to discover artists. So this was in 2011. Um, Imran Qureshi did this uh, um, Blessings Upon the Land of My Love, which was, uh, it was paint on the floor of a courtyard of a house, which is one of our exhibition venues. And if you look closely, they're painted flowers, but they almost look like blood. And he talks about a suicide bombing in a market. So all his beautiful memories of that market are tainted with this blood. And you can see the blood kind of collecting in the middle. 
So it's very powerful. This happened uh, at the time of the so-called Arab Spring. There was a lot of politics. Uh, this work was then uh, realized again. I, personally, I don't think it has the same effect, but it was realized again on the rooftop of the Met. So I sometimes things can't be kind of taken out of context like that. I don't think it had the same, the same feeling, but it's interesting that it would go from that context of war and a time where it was really, um, politically, it was very strained to uh, what you would think is a beautiful installation of flowers as on the rooftop of the man. This is the work from Bani Abidi that went to Documenta, that premiered at Documenta, so I added that picture. And of course, the biennial, which we have on at the moment, Sharjah Biennial 13, so working with Christine Tome at Ashkar Elwan in Beirut, she really wanted to work with different people uh, who have done a lot in different countries. And because we're very used to working in that way, we thought, yeah, we'll give it a try for the biennial. Although it does mean that our biennial is a year long, so it's a pretty long biennial, and we are traveling all over the world. Um, and sometimes to places that I can't even travel to. So I wasn't able to go to Ramallah, for example, which is the project happening now. And I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm not able to go to Beirut politically at the moment. So it's very interesting to have these projects happening at a place that you can't even attend, but I get to see it on Facebook Live or Instagram Live, which is, which is good. So we started the project of Sharjah in Dakar, mainly through Qadr Atiyah. So uh, Christine said, I want to work with these people, and I want to work with these cities. Qadr maybe in Algeria, maybe in Dakar. So it's interesting to kind of look at how that would work in discussions with him. And it ended up being in Dakar and looking at the theme of water. And uh, we held a conference there at the university. So the conference was attended a lot by the students and artists in, in Senegal. And that was in January. And then in March, we had the main uh, biennial exhibition in Sharjah. Um, in April, the dates are wrong because this was the initial one in April, actually. We had the one in Istanbul, which was a beautiful exhibition curated by Zainab Oz and Das uh, Art Projects, young curators who we got to meet and see their, their practice, which is great. And then in Ramallah, uh, uh, shifting ground with Lara Khaldi, which was a conference and an installation and a publication. And in October, October 13th, if anybody can make it to Beirut, uh, the Act 2 of Sharjah Biennial 13 will happen there in the form of an exhibition curated by Hisham Khaldi and uh, Reem Fatah. So it's interesting to do this in a different way in terms of a biennial model, um, but it's not that different from the kind of work that we do anyway in the art world. I think all of us are very global in the way we think, in the way we work. Um, it's just giving the people of those cities the opportunity to also uh, witness that. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say. And uh, more information, if you want, on the Biennial is on our website, but also on the Biennial website, which is tamawaj.org, uh, which links from our website if you, if you want more information. Um, but um, basically, I think the importance of of this biennial is that it's created certain, um, for example, we've never, we visit Istanbul Biennial, but we've never actually done an exhibition in Istanbul. And to be able to do a project outside of an institutional partnership is really kind of exciting because it's not, there's no bureaucracy around it. You just work with a curator, you know, they uh, have an abandoned house and you set up an exhibition. So it's a really alternative way of working then the other formal way that you have to work with museums where it's an institutional partnership. Um, and the same with, um, the same with, uh, with Ramallah as well. So I think in terms of that, we've learned a lot. Um, and yeah, we'll just continue to keep experimenting and, and see where it takes us. And I think that's my last slide. So I hope I'm, I'm okay for time. I don't know if anybody has any questions or if I sped through too quickly. No, if anybody has any questions, we have about 10 minutes, um, and we have a microphone as well. But first, let's thank you, Hoor, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. And to open to the floor, yes. I'm just 
just curious why you can't go to Ramallah or Beirut. I think the situation is a little bit political. My father is in a political position, so personally it would be difficult for me to go. I might get kidnapped. So. <laughs> That's why I might not get to go. <laughs> I risked it a few times, but I think now uh, I might not. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for that overview. Um, I'm curious, and this is maybe an elaboration of the previous question in a certain way, but more connected to culture and history. Um, how do you navigate a decision about whether or not to do a project in a place like Cairo, considering Cairo's own history of surrealism, and then in the case of Sudan, considering its own history? How do you? kind of bridge those gaps, and when something can't happen, maybe in the original context, how do you bring that back to that context yeah. in some way? Yeah, I think what, what we do, it's really with conversation. It's working with people in those positions, in those institutions. You know, we were very lucky in Cairo that the American University in Cairo wanted to partner with us on that. You know, it's very difficult to do things in Egypt, you know. Um, I'm still <laughs> struggling to do things in Egypt, but we managed which I think is a world record, to get the collection from Egypt to Korea. And we've exhibited the exhibition in Seoul. We were supposed to do a longer tour, but it's, it's, it's a real headache. I have to send the works back. So now the works are back in Cairo, back in storage. I don't know when people will see them again. But at least what we did is got the exhibition in Cairo and in, and in Korea. And it was very important. And we'll focus on the publication. and. Um, the same with, with, with Sudan, really. I mean, we were very lucky to do that um, and to have a lot of contacts and people who we could actually ask for help, uh, people in Sharjah and people uh, outside. So the thing is, like, we have rules. Of course, there's a lot of rules. But at the same time, we do try to work outside of the rules just to see you know, if something works or something doesn't work. So um, everything, that, a lot of the list of projects that came up were really an experiment, you know, like the March project. I was just tutoring, but I saw so much potential, I wanted to invite these students out, and they got to make friends, or, you know, the biennial, it wasn't meant to be my job, it just happened by accident. Long story, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't think there was a change in the, in the art. I think that politics has surrounded us for a very long time, I would say, you know, like uh, decades. So I think uh, there are artists who tend to focus on political work and artists who don't. Uh, of course, there was a lot happening when we had the biennial in 2011, and we focused as well on what was happening. Cause in the middle of the biennial, all this stuff started happening. So the curators commissioned um, uh, people to do sound, like sound works, based on the Arab Spring and uh, a film program. Uh, those were shown afterwards, uh, after the biennial. But other than that, I think it depends on the artist. It depends if they're living locally or living outside. Um, but I don't think I've seen that much of a change, because things are still up in the air. How do culture and mores interact or interfere with art? How do who, sir? Culture and mores and habits interfere with art, considering that art pushes things beyond the envelope. Okay, yeah, 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 what you're saying. Yeah, I think, um, I, don't, I don't, I mean, people are sensitive to the area. I mean, there are certain things that aren't shown like uh, pornographic works because at the end of the day everything we show is open to the public it's open there's no we don't charge admission so children who live in the area always come in so there are those kind of sensitivities but politically um, works are very charged we always say if things are shown if you could see them on the news you could talk about them I mean it's, it's on the news why can't you talk about it in a museum or in art so you know, I don't, and a lot of the times artists who do come, they always tend to uh, focus on the local contacts. So they don't, they've never really had to think about things that they can't show. Um, but basically that's the only thing that we wouldn't show, works that are overtly sexual or pornographic. But other than that, I think works fine. Hi. I was just wondering, um, 
was just wondering to what extent, if any, you're working with the uh, museums being established in Saudia Island in terms of their global histories that they're looking to establish. Yeah, I mean, um, we're not working on any projects at the moment. Of course, we're going to attend the opening of the new Louvre uh, on the 11th of November. Um, but we've had um, various talks or visits where they visited us, uh, but no, uh, no partnership yet. Yeah. But we actually curated the first exhibition on Sadiat Island, which was uh, disorientation part two, so that we did uh, there. I can't remember the year, but it was when Sadiat Island first opened. Um, so much of your work is about bringing undiscovered figures who may be in plain sight uh, to the public, including Ahmed Noor, who lives here in Chicago. And I wondered if you wanted to talk to us a little bit about his work. Yes, definitely. If I get my laptop, I have another presentation. Um, well, it's important for me to also see artists who haven't been discovered because they're not, you know, uh, you know, pushing themselves into meeting, you know, different museum directors. And it's, I think it's something all institutions are interested in. Everybody's searching for artists who have been undiscovered. Um, so working with Salah, I got to meet Amr, who's sitting here at the back. Um, luckily, coming to see us. <laughs> and it's been great because we also have another connection that we both went to the Slate. Not at the same time, but we were both ex late students, so we have a big connection there. And um, I discovered a lot of uh, Amr's work through Salah, so I'm very thankful of working, working with him. But every time I come to Chicago, I discover more things. And um, Amr's uh, work, uh, he started as a printmaker at the Slade and then a sculptor. And uh, hopefully you'll see his work in Chicago at the museum one day. He's been exhibited at the Arts Institute before. And we created, uh, we had a whole solo exhibition that opened in Sharjah and we commissioned new works, um, really large fiberglass uh, sculptures uh, based originally on themes of Sudan, like the gourd or the sheep, the grazing of the sheep. But if you look at them, they're very contemporary, they're very modern in their structure. And um, although Amr doesn't like that, they're very minimalist in the way they look. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, and we're also working on a book with Amr on this, hopefully soon. You know, there's only so much we can do in the office, but we're trying to, to get these, uh, these books out because it's very important that a lot of these artists are also recognized, and not only from the West. It's also important, important for us to show artists from our point of view, from where we are, and not always have the West discover us. So, so thank you, Amr, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, good to see you. Thank you for today. I have always been enamored by your um, reach and your sort of programming and how you're able to facilitate so many things in different parts of the world, especially yours, and you've introduced so many people to your part of the world. I just wondered how you distinguish, you know, your your um, your issues, where you prioritize, because there's so many things between the politics and then the environment, and I just wonder how that has sort of your organization and how you filter through, because you're accomplishing so many things, both locally, nationally, and internationally. I just wonder how you how you balance that all. Prioritize in terms of themes, you mean? Or yeah, and in yeah. terms of where you put the energy, and you know, you're helping the curators, the artists, no, the community. <laughs> um, well, I'm lucky to say that we did start as a small team. We were about four people, and now we're 200 people at the foundation. So, you know, things are better. I don't have to hang works anymore. I don't have to sweep the floor anymore or stick the labels. So I'm happy about that. And I'm trying not to be a control freak. But um, what we do is, I mean, when there's passion, you don't really think about the work behind it. Uh, we renovate a lot of buildings from the 70s. This is a big passion of mine. A lot of these buildings that are being torn down because they're in bad condition and the local town planning, they always call me. They say, nobody else is going to want these buildings and you're going to want them and people are going to tear them down. So this is another project that's really been exhausting and draining because of funding and fundraising. 
because all of our uh, projects are funded by the government and the few patrons that we have. Uh, so we try to get uh, funding from companies as well. Um, and we have a lot of like a cinema from the 70s that's been closed since the 70s. So that needs a lot of work to bring it back. And it's still the only cinema in this little town on the east coast by the sea. So they're beautiful buildings that shouldn't be destroyed. So we're, our interest in architecture comes in there, and just the preservation. Uh, but at the same time, you know, interest in art and working with artists is also important. So there's a lot. I think it's just ADD. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, speaking about what you just spoke on, uh, patrons and uh, business sponsors that very few you have, have you been approached to, or do you have any interest in in having, um, let's say, Air Arabia says to you, can you help us develop a um, collection or or some type of um, or some type of collaboration in that way? Do you would you welcome a facilitation of that yeah, nature? Sure. Or? Yeah, of course. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, we we need all the help we can get because a lot of our education programs are free. Because I don't want it to be just for the privileged, you know, to our other people to decide. I'll only send my child to one workshop. You know, so for us it's really important because it's bringing people together into these spaces and to facilitate all of that we need the funding. We have art centers across every town in Sharjah which are about seven, so we have seven centers um, that do education programs and uh, they're like little villages and towns, you know, there's a lot of that we can do but we don't have the money to, to keep it going unless we get support from people. So, so if, um, more specifically, if, if Air Arabia wanted you to help them develop a collection for their, like a corporate collection or something of that nature. Is yeah. that something? Well, I mean, advice, you mean, to give them advice? Or, or just to help them? I'm always willingly giving advice. Co collect us, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sure, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I, don't see the, I don't see any conflict there because, you know, uh, we, our small circle of patrons, we did, we took them to Freeze, London, we introduced them to other collectors, we introduced them to, you know, artists and galleries and, you know, the connections that we have and, you know, we take for granted and it's important to share that information because we really appreciate them being able to help us and support certain projects. Hi. Um, I was wondering if I could get your opinion on so it seems like what you spoke about were more like temporary projects, like biennials, and I know that the education programming that you have would be something that's more long-term, but I was kind of wondering of your opinion on things like um, commissioning like public sculpture, something that's more temp like permanent for the communities that you work in and maybe more like international geography. Well, yeah, that's an interesting question because I used to hate permanent installations because of the fact that the people in the surrounding area will start ignoring that and people who would grow up with it will think it's just part of you know, the landscape they're in and not question what it's trying to talk about. Um, a lot of the courtyards that we use in biennials, they change every two years, so there's an excitement that happens in the neighborhood, what's going to be installed here, they watch us installing something new. So that for us is more interesting than having a permanent uh, installation, but the problem we have with some of the works in our collection that it's a lot of work to take them down and reinstall them. So we're trying to uh, build a new building for our collection to house some of the permanent installations that are, are going to be problematic. And with that, we decided to go closer to the university so that the students can actually even walk to the museum. So it's, it's difficult when it's something site specific, I would say, just because with, you engage with the audience and the community when you're trying to install something. For me, the most exciting thing is witnessing the people's discussions while we're installing um, and something's coming up, yeah. yeah. We'll just have one, one more question. Sorry I missed your first uh, shuttle bus was late. Um, going along with this public art, yeah. I'm a Jerome Schmidt, you're real alumni, I see 74, so I'm more fine arts. But is there a mural movement? You know, I'm thinking Pilsen in Chicago on about 18th Street in Ashland. 
They have a lot of murals. Do you? And even I'm watching DW News from Berlin, they show a lot of uh, artists doing mural movements, which can get political. Yeah. Do you have a lot of support, or yeah, I mean, what's your opinion on political murals and art? For me, I think I, a lot of the murals, you would call them, or the graffiti or street art, has become a little um, glamorized. They're, it's more design and art and not political anymore, so I tend not to work with that, because for me, street art is for the street. And it's an, it, there's a reason that it's on the street and it shouldn't be part of an institution, because then it loses its meaning of it being kind of you know anti-institution. Um, there are other uh, departments in Sharjah, including development uh, um, planning, and they do a lot of murals with artists because it beautifies the city. But um, for me personally, I tend to steer away from from those projects. Yeah. Thank you so much for all of your Thank talk. You. Thank you for all your generous questions.